Chapter 20 The Bell's Secret Frantically, Nancy pounded on the heavy door. Again, she heard the muffled voice on the other side, but could not make out the words. Maybe the person was asking where the secret door was. The bench, she cried. Pull on the bench. At that moment, the tolling of the bell reverberated throughout their rocky prison, followed by a thunderous roar as the surf from the ocean rushed into the cave. Drenched with spray, Nancy and the two men clung to the wall. As the noise subsided, they saw the swirling water rising toward their feet. Pull! screamed Nancy, pounding on the door as hard as she could. Turn the handle and pull the bench! An eternity seemed to pass as the water lapped closer. Then slowly the door began to open inward. Gas fumes poured out, but Nancy staggered forward, holding her breath. Behind her came Amos Hendrick. Grumper, paralyzed with fear, cowered on the steps below. Nancy caught a glimpse of their rescuer, a young man in a gas mask which protected him from the fumes. He was Ned! Water coming, she gasped. Man still below. Go on, he shouted to Nancy. She assisted Amos Hendrick to the passageway, where the air was comparatively fresh. Ned ran down to the frightened little man on the stairway and hustled him inside the laboratory. Barely in time to prevent the room from being flooded, Ned pushed the bench door shut. Then he turned to Grumper. The man had collapsed on the floor, a victim of the fumes he had concocted. Ned picked him up in a fireman's carry. When he staggered into the cottage with his burden, he pulled off his gas mask. Nancy's first question was, Where's George? She went down to the outside cave entrance with a trooper, Ned replied. Nancy, you owe your life to George, he said soberly. And to you, Nancy said. He waved aside the remark and continued. When I delivered your prisoner to state police headquarters, I asked one of the troopers to return here with me. We couldn't find anyone inside the cottage. Then we shouted your names and heard George pounding on the door hidden by the fishnets. George was convinced you were lying unconscious in the fume-filled room. Fortunately, the trooper had a gas mask, a flashlight, and other equipment in his car. That's about all there is to tell, except that when I couldn't find you in the laboratory, I became desperate. Just as I started away again, I heard you pound on the bench door. Nancy was too shaken to say much. At that moment, George rushed into the cottage wild-eyed. Seeing Nancy, she flung her arms about her friend. Oh, you're safe, she cried. And I thought... Ned turned Grumper over to the state trooper. Anyone else downstairs, he asked. No, Nancy spoke up. But did you catch his partner on the cliff? To a negative reply, Nancy said, The worst criminal of all has escaped. Harry Tyrox, who also calls himself Monsieur Papier and Mr. James. He must have seen you coming and decided his freedom meant more to him than Hendrick's money. Just give me a description of him and we'll pick him up, the police officer said confidently. I'll notify headquarters over my car radio. Nancy and her friends returned to Mrs. Chantry's house. Within an hour, they were informed that Harry Tyrox had been captured on the road while attempting to flee. Immediately, Nancy telephoned her father to tell of the arrests. Good work, Nancy, he said proudly. I knew you wouldn't need me to clear up the case. The next morning, Nancy and the others were given permission to talk to Grumper and Harry Tyrox. Soon, the whole swindling operation was revealed. Based on information given by the two prisoners, New York police were alerted to pick up the man whom Mr. Drew had met when he went to see Tyrox. Ferdinand Slocum, the hotel clerk in Fisher's Cove, had been brought in for questioning. Frightened, the man admitted his part in the swindle. Harry Tyrox and I were friends. He offered me a cut in the cosmetic and perfume business if I would let him use the hotel for some of his shady deals, he confessed. After Harry saw Mr. Drew in New York, he phoned me that the lawyer was coming to Candleton, and something had to be done to keep him at Fisher's Cove. 
so I told Amy we had to get busy. Your wife? Nancy asked. Yes. Go on with your story. I might as well tell it from the beginning. Soon after we were married, Amy mentioned the hidden door and the passageway to the cave. Her foster father had a workshop down there. Surely he didn't build the tunnel himself. No, it was there when the McGuire's bought the cottage. Old Grandpa McGuire discovered the closed-up entranceway one day when he was repairing the wall, and the secret was always kept in the family. The cave originally was used as a hideout by pirates. Tell me about the cosmetic factory, Nancy urged. Whose idea was that? Harry's. I foolishly told him about the workshop above the cave, and right away he thought he saw a chance for big money. The plan was to make cheap imitations of very expensive products and sell them under the Moncur name. First, he got the Maguires out by telling them Amy was in trouble with the police and they would be disgraced when the townspeople heard about it. They packed up and moved away immediately. How did Grumper figure in the scheme? Harry knew about him and some crimes he'd committed. He promised Grumper a lot of money if he'd come in with us and work as our chemist. Grumper thought he could use the money to go away someplace where no one knew him, so he agreed. But he didn't figure on Amos Hendrick. He upset Grumper's plans, Nancy inquired with a smile. He turned them upside down. Grumper was in a panic that Hendrick would find him and reclaim the stolen jeweled bell. How did he learn Mr. Hendrick was in Candleton? Through his cousin Franz, who served as a lookout at the cliff. Whenever people came near the cave, he sounded the gong and Grumper, hearing it in the laboratory, hurried down and tried to scare them away with his ghost act. Then the rush of water and the tolling bell had nothing to do with his appearances, said Nancy. No, but they sometimes happen close together, Slocum replied. Whenever Franz spied someone on the cliff, he would run down to the laboratory and have Grumper send up sleeping gas fumes through crevices in the rocks. I know now that Franz was the second little elf I thought I saw in my dream, Nancy exclaimed. He frequently came to the South Sandy shop and carried away food. Yes, he had a little car hidden in some bushes at the foot of the cliff. I suppose he also stole the note A.H. lost at the shop, Nancy said. That's right. Franz knew A.H. by sight and happened to see him drop the note in the tea room. Later, he stole it from the drawer. Before Franz could show it to Grumper, Harry Tyrox got hold of it and then the cat was out of the bag. He tried to get the bell, but Grumper wouldn't let him have it. Harry was afraid of him because he could put people to sleep with his drugs. Tell me, said Nancy, were you the person who passed my friend George in the passageway yesterday morning? Slocum started. I was there, but I didn't know anybody else was. We have a secret closet with a stone door where we keep Moncar products. I was in the closet. When I came out, the passage was dark. My flashlight didn't show up anybody. Did you lock the door at the top of the stairs? Yes. Nancy went on. You haven't told me how my father was drugged. When your father told Harry and his pal he intended to prosecute, Harry knew we had to do something quick. Harry followed Mr. Drew to the New York airport, then telephoned Madame to intercept him. We were ordered to see that he conveniently disappeared for a few weeks. Grumper made up a vial of liquid which would turn into sleeping fumes and gave it to Madame. She arranged to get into a taxi with Mr. Drew and just before leaving it, opened the bottle and dropped a small amount of the liquid on his coat. It was just enough to affect him, but not the driver. How did my father reach Fisher's Cove Hotel? The driver of the cab had been paid by our men and knew what to do. He took your father there. I registered him under another name and then kept an eye on him. It was Madame, I suppose, disguised as a maid who had my father moved from his room. Right. Whenever he was getting better, she gave him another dose and put him to sleep. By accident, the hotel manager discovered your father's condition and called Dr. Warren. 
when Harry overheard the manager tell me to call you. He decided that you were to be drugged too, and removed with your father to some other hideout. But Amy, my wife, was afraid I was getting in too deep with the gang and wanted to spike that part of the plan. That's why she warned you by telephone to keep away. At the last minute, Harry concluded the double kidnapping was too risky and called it off. Your wife was far wiser than you, Mr. Slocum. I wish now I had listened to her, the hotel clerk said miserably. My wife works in a beauty salon. The day you came for your father, she borrowed a wig from there, dressed as an old lady, and looked for you in the lobby. Then she was the one who dropped the note into my lap. That's right. Nancy and her friends were happy when they learned that Harry Tyrox, alias Monsieur Papier and Mr. James, together with his New York accomplice, still possessed most of the money he had fleeced from innocent victims. Mrs. Chantry, Mother Matilda, and the others who had bought the worthless stock would recover a sizable amount of the cash they had put into it. "'What will become of Amy?' George asked, as the girl sat on the Chantry porch after lunch, discussing the case. "'Her husband will be sentenced to prison, and she'll be left alone.' "'The Maguires are taking her back,' Nancy replied. "'Mother Matilda phoned me a little while ago. "'They're all returning to the cottage in a few days. "'Which reminds me, we should go there this minute.' "'But why?' Bess asked in surprise. "'All the gang have been caught.' "'True, but the mystery of the cave is only half solved. "'Mr. Hendrick recovered the jeweled bell from Grumper. "'But we know it wasn't his bell that frightened people away from the place. "'Another bell must be somewhere in the cave. "'I intend to find out.' "'Nancy sprang to her feet. "'Anyone going with me?' "'How about me?' inquired a voice from the driveway. Turning quickly, the girl saw Ned Nickerson approaching the porch. It was his last day in Candleton, and Bess and George generously declined an invitation to ride with the couple to the McGuire home. Why this trip? Ned asked. Anything special? I want to clear away the moldy food and cobwebs Tyrox and his men left there. The McGuires would be shocked and I'd like to find the tolling bell. At the deserted cottage, the two spent an hour cleaning away the debris. Then Nancy looked at her watch. The tide won't come in for a while. We can make a complete investigation of the cave. Ned chuckled. I came prepared. I have a gasoline lantern in the car, and it gives off a brilliant light. We'll really be able to see what's down there. He went for it, and Nancy found two blocks of wood to prop open the secret doors. The cosmetic factory bore only a faint trace of fumes. Passing through it quickly, Nancy and Ned went down the stone steps to the bottom of the cave. With the tide out, it was possible to walk on the ledge to the entrance. Nancy turned the other way, however, and asked Ned to focus the light in that direction. Almost at once, she found the gaping hole through which the water rushed in at high tide. To Ned's astonishment, she reached her arm far back into the gap. What are you looking for? he demanded. Nancy did not answer, but a moment later she asked his help to pull out a rusty, corroded bell. As it swung slowly, a doleful tolling echoed in the cave. The warning bell! Ned exclaimed. How did you know it was hidden back there? I didn't, but I got to thinking about the story of the pirates and the loot they hid here. Yes, but the bell never rang until recently, Ned protested. How can you explain that? My guess is that at the time the pirates hid their loot in this cave, the opening was very small and only a little water trickled through when the tide came in. Perhaps they placed the bell where it would be tapped lightly when water struck it, and they'd know the tide had changed. But as the years went on, the waves carved a wider opening, and more and more water poured into the cave. And just recently the violent action of the waves has caused the bell to toll loudly enough to be heard outside the cave. That bell must be very old, Ned commented. 
Maybe it has been in this cave since Revolutionary War years. I'm sure of it, Ned. Nancy peered at the trademark, then excitedly she said, This is a Paul Revere bell! Just what A.H. said he was looking for! I should like to keep it. A.H. said yesterday he wanted to reward me for recovering the jeweled bell. This bell is reward enough for me. No one could dispute your claim to it but the pirates. Ned chuckled as he took the bell. He carried it up the stone stairway, through the laboratory, and up to the cottage. It must have been very exciting in the old days, Nancy said wistfully. How I wish I could have been here to solve a mystery when the cave was a pirate's hideout. Mysteries, Ned exclaimed, turning out the lantern. Haven't you had enough of them? Nancy was sure she never would have. Soon an intriguing invitation would involve her in another baffling mystery, the clue in the old album. Anyway, said Ned, there's one puzzle I wish you would solve for me. What's that? Why you always change the subject when I try to talk to you about something that isn't a bit mysterious? Nancy smiled and said, Ned, someday I'll promise to listen. The End